All right. Good morning. Welcome to today's class. Today we have a guest speaker, Dan Cranston from Virginia Commonwealth University. He was a PhD student at University of Illinois and a postdoc at Rutgers. I hope I didn't mess it up. And he will take uh, us on a tour through the potential method, which is some enhanced discharging, maybe. Or yeah, yeah. He will tell us. Okay. All right. Part. Cool. So, uh, so thanks for having me, Bernard. Um, this is going to be the first of two lectures today and then Thursday on this potential method. Um, so, like Bernard said, it's sort of uh, an added uh, layer that you can put on top of the, the paradigm for discharging and reducibility proofs. Um, so I'm going to talk some about a result that uh, I proved with, uh, with Matt Yancey. Um, but to start out with, uh, today I'm going to actually uh, tell you a lot about some uh, previous result of Kostochka and Yancey that uh, is a little bit simpler to uh, to phrase and simpler to prove. Um, and then I'll kind of uh, make some analogies between what they did and what we did. So as you're going along, um, at any point, if you have questions, feel free to butt in. That's fine. This is a relatively small number of people on the call. So I don't think it'll be a problem if you just, if you just unmute yourself and just talk. Um, okay, so let's start with, uh, this is called Gritch's theorem. It says if you're a planar graph and you have no three cycle, then, uh, then your chromatic number is at most three. And that's sort of the best you could hope for because uh, you can get long odd cycles uh, that still need three colors. Um, so here's another theorem that seems like it's weaker. It says if G is planar with no three cycle and no four face. So I think this is standard notation, but I'll just say three cycle means a cycle of length three, face means a face of length four. Um, then the chromatic number of G is at most three. Uh, and so this, uh, this second statement seems like it's obviously implied by the first statement because this is a proper subset of the, the graphs in the first statement. But what I want to show you is that actually these two theorems are, uh, are equivalent. It's easy to deduce the second one from the first one. Uh, and it's also easy to deduce the uh, first one from the second one, which is kind of the non-trivial direction. So the picture is like this. What you want to do is you want to take your graph that maybe has four faces in it. You've got some planar graph embedded in the plane, no three uh, cycles, no four faces. Uh, and what you want, uh, and it, it does potentially have four faces, sorry. Um, and what you want to do is you want to sort of fold them away um, like so. So you want to identify W and Y. And if you can do that, then you could um, proceed by induction. Or another way to think about it is you can sort of repeatedly fold away all the four faces until there's no four faces left. And then, uh, and then you can invoke this seemingly weaker uh, proof. Now, the problem with trying to do something like this is that you might create a three cycle, right? So maybe you didn't have a three cycle but then when you identify W and Y, you create a three cycle. So that is something we want to avoid. So if this happens, then it's because you had some path like this, okay? So in that case, there's just no helping it. We can't uh, identify W and Y. So we instead try and go to V and X. And we say, okay, well, instead, let's just identify V and X. Um, and that's going to work great unless, again, you create a three cycle. Okay, but now here's the good news. Uh, you can't fail both ways because if you create this three cycle, then you had this path between V and X of length three, and you also had this path between W and Y of length three. But because you have this planar embedding, those paths have to intersect and this picture slightly oversimplifies things, but not too much. And those paths will intersect somewhere that ends up being a common neighbor of either V and W or W and X or V and Y or Y and X. Um, and no matter which common neighbor it is, you end up getting a three cycle. 
And so that's going to violate your hypothesis that you have no three cycle here um, uh, or right here, say. Um, so just to be clear, what we're trying to do is we're trying to prove Grotius theorem assuming this seemingly weaker statement. And so whenever you have a four phase, you try to fold it away. And what this argument is showing is that one of these two folding ways is going to work. They can't both fail because if they both fail, then you actually had a three cycle to start with, which violates your hypothesis. Okay, so, so that's essentially really the proof of the equivalence of these two things. You can formalize it with induction on the number of vertices or induction on the number of four faces, whatever you like. But that's really the, the heart of the proof. Uh, now, one thing that, uh, that I've seen, so I, I work a lot on coloring sort of sparse graphs, uh, which very intuitively just means there's not that many edges. Um, and one natural class of graphs that are sparse is planar graphs or planar graphs uh, where the girth, which is the length of the shortest cycle, uh, is bounded from below, right? So if you have planar graphs with no three cycles, then they have, uh, they have at most uh, two n minus four edges on n vertices. Uh, or if they have you know, higher girth then the number of edges uh, continues to decrease. So we can think of this as a, as a sparsity uh, corollary that comes from being planar and having this high girth. But the question is, do we really need this planarity? Could we just set aside the planarity altogether and say, all you really need is whatever upper bound you have on the number of vertices, on the number of edges um, that comes from being planar and having high girth? Here you're planar and you have girth at least four, right? So, so if we're gonna try to dream for that, um, then one thing we, we need to observe is uh, when you color a graph, you also color every proper subgraph. Uh, and so if you're going to just color based on sparsity, then you need the subgraphs to be sparse as well, right? Um, so one, one way you can kind of think of it about this is these things typically go by induction where you say, okay, it's sparse. So there's some good part that I can rip out. Um, I delete it. And then I want to color the smaller thing by induction. Um, and so I need every proper subgraph to still satisfy the hypothesis. Um, uh, and so you want your sparsity condition to hold for all the proper subgraphs. So, it's not too hard to prove uh, if G is planar with no three cycle and no four cycle, then the max average degree is bounded strictly below 10 thirds. Um, so have you guys seen max average degree? Yes, okay. So there's a, there's a sort of an easy exercise that comes from Euler's formula that says, if you're, uh, if you're planar with girth at least little g, then, uh, then the max average degree is bounded strictly below two times g over g minus two. Um, so when you plug in g equals five, you get two times five over five minus two, which is this 10 thirds. Um, so, uh, so this is fairly straightforward to show. And we might say, well, maybe it's enough just to have max average degree less than 10 thirds. And then we could get uh, we could get that it's three colorable. That would be great. So we go ahead and we make this conjecture. If the max average degree is less than 10 thirds, then uh, the chromatic number is at most three. Um, and we're very excited about our conjecture uh, until we run into graphs like K4. So K4 is three regular. Um, and so it has you know, average degree and max average degree three, which is obviously less than 10 thirds. And K4 is not uh, three colorable obviously. Um, these are what's called uh, the necklaces. So you can kind of think of these as, these are the little beads down here at the bottom, and then this is the back of the necklace kind of going around, right? And so you can extend this and make, uh, you can make arbitrarily long necklaces. Um, and all of these graphs need four colors. So you can kind of think of, if you tried to three color, what, what happened is you would go one here, and then two and three here, and then you would be forced to use one here. 
right? And then you're in trouble because you've got this edge between the two vertices colored one. Um, and it's the same thing if you add more beads, you use one here and then one here and then one here, and then you're in trouble, right? So these are graphs uh, that need four colors. Uh, so they're all, they're all counterexamples to our, our conjecture. In order to see that, one thing we should uh, comment on is that the max average degree is really less than 10 thirds for all of these. So one way to think about that is if you look at this one on the left, well, that's just K4. Um, and K4 is three regular, so the max average degree is three. That's fine. Um, when you add another one of these little beads down here on your necklace, what you do is you add three more vertices and you add five more edges. Okay, so uh, sort of in a sense, the, the average degree of the thing that you add is two times five divided by three. So the average degree of the thing you add is 10 thirds, right? Um, and so what you can do is you can think a little bit of, you're sort of taking a weighted average between the old average degree, which was three, and the average degree of the thing you add, which is 10 thirds. So it sort of pushes the average degree of the whole thing towards 10 thirds. Um, and so when you add a bunch of these beads, you're gonna get really close to 10 thirds from below, um, but you're always gonna be strictly less than 10 thirds. Um, and that's for average degree and, and showing that the, uh, the max average degree really is the average degree is a little bit of a tedious exercise, but it's, it's somewhat straightforward. Um, so does that make sense so far? Yeah, okay, cool. So here we are, we have our, our lovely conjecture that we really like. Um, and unfortunately, we have this infinite family of counterexamples. So my advice to you is don't give up. Um, when you have a conjecture that you like, even if you find counterexamples, don't give up. Try to sort of come up with some way to reword the conjecture to, uh, to somehow sidestep your counterexamples. That would be what we wanna try. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, we need to sort of measure this uh, this average degree, we need a better way to measure it than max average degree. Uh, so we're going to introduce something called the row function. And so row is defined on subsets of the vertices. And this is for some fixed graph G. Uh, and it's five times the number of vertices minus three times the number of edges induced by those vertices. Uh, and this potential function is the minimum of rho taken over all, uh, sorry, yeah, of rho taken over all subsets of vertices that are, uh, that are non empty. So the thing to think about with this rho function is um, if your graph had average degree exactly uh, 10 thirds, Right, so the average degree is twice the number of edges. So if the average degree is 10 thirds, then the number of edges, is, sorry, is twice the number of edges over the number of vertices. So um, basically the thing to, to sort of realize is if your graph had average degree exactly 10 thirds, then this potential function, this row function would work out to actually be zero, okay? Um, it's sort of just a little bit of algebra pushing things around, but this five and three are coming from the fact that you're interested in how uh, the average degree of your graph relates to 10 thirds. And if your average degree is much smaller than 10 thirds, then this row function is gonna be big, it's gonna be positive. And if your uh, average degree goes above 10 thirds, then this is gonna become negative. So using the same argument uh, that I mentioned about uh, proving that max average degree uh, is less than 10 thirds when you're planar with girth at least five, uh, if you use that same argument and you're just a little bit more careful, you can actually show that if you've got girth at least five in your planar, then this potential is at least five. So I had said before that the, uh, the MAD was less than 10 thirds. And so that would mean that the potential was strictly positive. 
But if you're very careful in, uh, in just paying attention to the constants, you get that the potential is at least five. And again, think about, so what you're doing here is this row function, um, it's a better measure because in some sense it's saying how much are you off from being uh, average degree 10 thirds, how much are you off additively rather than multiplicatively? And so because it's additive, it sort of gives you a finer control on knowing what's going on. And so here's the great news. So all of these necklaces, these things that were our, our counterexamples that we were worried about, if you work through them, they actually have potential only two, okay? So this is good because what it means is we've managed to sort of separate, put space between the, the graphs that we're really interested in and our counterexamples, right? Before the counterexamples were sort of covered up in our description of things with mad less than 10 thirds, they were included. And now we find, found a way to sort of drive a wedge between the graphs we actually care about and our counterexamples, right? So now what we want is we wanna say something like, uh, you know, if your graph has potential at least five, then you're three colorable. That would be the kind of thing we'd want to prove, uh, because then you can sidestep these necklace counterexamples and you're happy. And in fact, that's exactly what uh, Kostochka and Yancey did. They said if the potential is at least three. So basically, what this is saying is intuitively, it's saying. Uh, you can have max average degree very close to uh, very close to 10 thirds, but it sort of needs to be a little bit less. And this potential function is doing a good job of measuring that little bit less in a better way than max average degree is. So uh, how do they prove their theorem? So let me give you a sketch just on what remains of this slide. Um, so. The key observation, right, I've kind of mentioned is potential positive is equivalent with MAD being less than 10 thirds. Um, and that's sort of the intuition to keep in mind. So what we're gonna do here, uh, we assume that the, this theorem here is false and we take a, a counterexample and among all counterexamples, we choose one that's, that has as few vertices as possible. Um, now, because it has as few vertices po as possible, you know that the min degree has to be at least three. Because if you have a vertex of degree one or two, you can just delete it, color the rest of the graph by minimality, because uh, it's smaller than, than a minimal counterexample. And then you put this vertex back in, and it's only got at most two neighbors, and it's got three colors. So you can finish the coloring. Um, so what you want to show, you want to show that each vertex of degree three has neighbors of degree more than three, degree four or more. Um, and the reason is, so we said that this is gonna be a reducibility and discharging proof, right? And so the idea is that we're gonna use discharging uh, and we're trying to get to average degree 10 thirds. If we assume that we have a counterexample, if we can show that the average degree is at least 10 thirds, then that's, that's a contradiction because our, hypothesis was that MAD was less than 10 thirds, okay? So how do, you, uh, how do you show, get to 10 thirds? Well, the only people, so the natural thing to do is to start out with charge equal to your degree. And then we wanna sort of move the charge around and show that everybody ends up with charge at least 10 thirds. And that will tell us that the average degree was at least 10 thirds. So when you start out with charge equal to your degree, if you're trying to get to 10 thirds, that's a little bit more than three. So the people that need charge are these three vertices. The people that have extra charge are everybody of degree four or more, okay? So if you could show that each three vertex has these two four plus neighbors, uh, then okay, everybody starts with charge degree and each four plus vertex gives one sixth to each three neighbor. So when you do that, what happens? Well, for the three vertex, you started with three and you got two sixths, so you get up to 10 thirds. That's great. And if you're degree four or more, then you gave away uh, at most one sixth of your degree, but uh, because your degree at least four, that's 20 over six, which is 10 over three, okay? So this is sort of 
this is sort of the, the discharging part that you're gonna do at the end. Um, the work in their proof is showing that in fact, each three vertex has two neighbors that are degree four or more, okay? Uh, oh yeah, so that gives you a contradiction because you were assuming your mad was less than 10 thirds. So what you need is, what you wanna do is you wanna show that if you have a vertex of degree three, and it's got two neighbors that are both degree three, then that's a reducible configuration. You can delete those guys or somehow take some of it out, color the smaller graph by minimality, and then you can put it back in and extend the coloring. So how are we going to, how are we gonna prove that these things are reducible? And that's where this potential method is gonna be really useful. And we've got something called the gap lemma. So what does the gap lemma say? So the gap lemma says, if W is a proper subset of the vertices with at least two vertices, then the potential of W is greater than or equal to six. So first off, um, why, would this be, uh, why would this be useful? Well, okay, so our plan is, um, Let's go back for just a second. Our plan is um, that we, we wanna rip this stuff out. We're trying to prove this thing is reducible. We wanna rip it out and then color the smaller thing by minimality, and then you put it back in and you extend the coloring. Now, if you look at the way that potential is defined, potential uh, is going to be, when you take a proper subgraph, the potential is always gonna be at least as big on the proper subgraph because we defined it to be the min over all sets of vertices, okay? So, so this, because the potential uh, for every subgraph is gonna be at least three, when you delete some stuff, you're going to be able to color by, uh, by minimality or by the induction hypothesis, right? Um, but now, so we knew that the potential was gonna be at least three, but now this gap lemma is telling us something even better. It's telling us that the potential is gonna be at least six. Um, and so what does that mean intuitively? Remember, bigger potential means that your graph is sparser. You're sort of missing more edges relative to an average degree of 10 thirds. <clears throat> so, a really useful corollary that you can get from this gap lemma is that if you take any induced subgraph, so you take some subset of vertices W, you look at the subgraph induced by that, you pick some edge that's missing, you can put that edge in and then still be able to three color the graph. So this is a really, this is a really useful uh, corollary for, uh, for proving reducibility. So here's the picture. You've got your graph G, you take some subset of vertices W, uh, there's some missing edge, and then you're going to just add that edge. And now by the gap lemma, or by this corollary, which I'll prove for you in just a second, you can still three color it. And so basically what that's gonna do is, um, it's gonna, adding the edge in is gonna allow you to sort of require more of your three coloring than if you were to just three color the graph straight away. So how do we actually prove this? So let G prime be this uh, subgraph induced by W and then you add the edge. So G prime is sort of what's in this picture now with this added edge. And we want to show that the potential of G prime is still gonna be at least three. Because if you can do that, then you can just go by the induction hypothesis. So what we're gonna do is we consider any particular subgraph uh, uh, of these vertices in G prime. So if you're just a single vertex, uh, then you go back, remember the potential is five times the number of vertices minus three times the number of edges induced by those vertices. So if you're just a single vertex, then you don't induce any edges. So your percent potential is just five. Um, if you have at least two vertices, now this is the really cool thing, your potential in this new graph G prime, well, it's, it's just the same as your potential in the old graph, except maybe you added in an edge 
And if you added in an edge, then you have to subtract off three more from that edge, right? Uh, so the good news is the potential of our old subgraph X, that was at least six in G, right? Um, and so when you subtract off this edge, you, the three for that edge, uh, the potential still stays no smaller than three. So it drops maybe from six all the way down to three, but three is enough, right? And so we're able to still invoke the induction hypothesis and color it. All right, so uh, before I go on to uh, how you use this, does this, does this uh, proof idea make sense? Yeah? Okay, cool, good. All right, so now I said, what we wanna do is we want to prove that, uh, that a vertex of degree three can't have lots of degree three neighbors. And one of the, um, one of the useful uh, lemmas along the way is proving that if you have a triangle, at most one vertex on that triangle can be degree three. So what we wanna show is if you have this triangle and two vertices on the triangle are degree three, then that's reducible, okay? And so you assume that you have that. And now what are you gonna do? Uh, you're gonna delete those two vertices, right? And you're gonna add in this edge. So you deleted the vertices and you add in that edge there. And now what happens when you do that? You're able to color that, you're able to three color that resulting graph exactly by this corollary, right? And so now we, so when you, when you come back to the original graph, what you've done is it's like you just deleted these two guys and you colored everything else, but now you're requiring that these two guys have different colors. And that's actually really useful. Um, so sort of the worst case is when this guy down here gets color three. Um, and in that case, uh, if you've got color three here, then you can use color two on the left and you can use color one on the right. It's sort of easier if, if this thing down here is color one or color two, then uh, you can just kind of greedily do it. And the last vertex you color will be fine because it's got two neighbors with the same color. But I want to point out that if you weren't able to put that edge in, right? So if you didn't require that these guys get different colors, then when you invoke the induction hypothesis, right? So if you go to delete uh, those guys and say you didn't put that edge in, maybe you get color one here and you also get color one here, right? And so then when you come back and you try to extend the coloring, you've got color one here and color one here and color two down here, but now you're in trouble because both guys on the triangle need to get color three, but they're adjacent, so it doesn't work. Okay, so this adding that edge in is really useful uh, for proving that certain configurations are reducible. Okay, so that is how you use the gap lemma uh, to prove that something is reducible. So this is not the whole proof, but this is kind of a, a hint of how, uh, how they go about proving that every three vertex uh, has to have at least two neighbors of degree four or more. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about how you actually prove the gap lemma, because this is um, this is really sort of interesting and a little bit surprising the first time you see it. But when you look at lots and lots of examples, um, all of the examples of using the potential method, the proof of the gap lemma looks very similar. Um, and so there's a lot of things that sort of the first time you see it, it looks like magic, but by the, like the fifth time you see it, it's just technique. Right, it's just, that's how you do it. Um, okay, so we wanna prove the gap lemma. Um, so this is our, our definition of rho. And let me point out uh, this observation. And this is fairly straightforward. What I'm saying here is, actually, let me see if I can draw a picture real quick. Um, all right, so uh, this is saying, um, if you've got, if you've got two disjoint uh, vertex sets, X and Y, 
and you want the potential of the whole thing, right, of their union, uh, then how do you do it? Well, what you do is you take the potential of the stuff of X, the subgraph induced by X, and then the potential of uh, or rho for the stuff induced by Y, right? And so we, we just write rho Y where Y is a set of vertices, but you're sort of really thinking about sort of the subgraph induced by those vertices, right? Because there's, there's some vertices over here um, and maybe there's some edges. There's some vertices over here and maybe there's some edges. Um, and the point is all of the edges that are in X, the vertices and edges in X, they get counted in row X. And all the vertices and edges in Y, they get counted in row Y. The only thing that you have to uh, account for are vertices and edges, are, are edges that go between these two parts, right? They're not counted when you look at just the subgraph induced by X, they're not counted. And when you look at just the subgraph induced by Y, they're not counted. So basically the proof here, what you're saying is every vertex and edge uh, in the subgraph induced by X union Y, it's either over on this side and then it gets counted by row X or it's over on this side and it gets counted by row Y or it's an edge going between the two parts. And then it's gonna, you're gonna have to add it in here and count for it here, okay? So essentially this comes from the fact that this is a, this function is, is sort of modular, um, but okay. So let me, any questions on this little observation before we go on? Um, I'm gonna delete the picture. So that's why uh, we need the space. Okay, all uh, right. So now we wanna prove this gap lemma. So the idea is you assume that the gap lemma is false. So there's some subset of R that's a proper subset with at least two vertices um, and its potential uh, is at most five. And so now what we're gonna do, we pick among all counterexamples R, we pick one that has um, row of R minimum, okay? Um, so if the size of R is at most three, then this is really pretty easy to check. Um, what you can do is it's easy to check a, a single vertex or K2 or K3. And sort of the worst cases are the cliques because when you take edges out, then the potential or then the row value is just gonna increase. Um, so you just check for a single vertex, it's five. For a K2, it's five plus five minus three, which is seven. And for K3, it turns out that it's six. Um, so then uh, you need to, uh, you need to look at the case where R is at least four. And, and here what, here's what we're gonna do. We know we can three color this thing um, by, uh, by minimality or by induction. And now what you're gonna do is you're gonna contract each of those color classes down to a single vertex. So you have some three coloring of this subgraph induced by R and then you just identify all of the vertices that are colored one into a single vertex that will be one. Identify all the vertices that are colored two into a single vertex that will be colored two and same for three. Um, and then if the edges aren't there, you add in these edges between the one, two and three. And you uh, delete any parallel edges. Okay, so now here's the thing. If you could three color this graph G prime, then it would give you a three coloring of the original graph, right? Um, so there's a couple things to, uh, to think about. The first thing is if you can three color uh, G prime, then you could assume that the colors on the triangle actually match the colors that you sort of put on the triangle. So if this vertex arose from color class one and this arose from color class two and this arose from color class three, you can assume that the coloring of G prime uses those colors. If not, you just swap the colors. Um, and then what you wanna do is if you could color G prime, then you can just sort of uncontract this coloring of G prime to go all the way back up to G, right? So you're, everything outside stays the same, 
And then this little bit on the triangle, you uncontract it to this coloring phi. Um, and it would give you a coloring of the graph G. Okay, so because we're assuming that in the big picture, right, we're assuming that G is a counterexample. So G doesn't have a coloring. So since G doesn't have a coloring, G prime also doesn't have a coloring. Um, so there must be some set of vertices inside uh, G prime that have potential too small or that have rho too small. Otherwise the potential for the whole graph would be at least three um, and you could just color. So there must be, and so intuitively what you should think about is there has to be some subgraph uh, where the, it's dense, where there's sort of too many edges per vertex. Okay, so we'll take that S. Uh, and now that S, it does have to intersect Z somewhere because if it didn't intersect Z, then the potential in G prime of S would just be the exact same as the potential in G of S. Um, but um, we know that it's at most two, but we know that for G, every subset has potential at least three. Uh, I'm saying potential when I mean rho. Um, uh, that rho of S uh, has to be, uh, since it's at most two, and here rho of every subset is at least three, um, that S must not exist, must not induce quite that same subgraph in G. So it must be that you're using some of these vertices that you contracted down. So now what we're going to do we're going to sort of lift up S, we're going to pull it back to G. And so what you do is you take S here and you throw away the intersection with Z. And in place of that intersection with Z, you put in R, okay? And so we're interested in rho in G of S minus Z union R, okay? And what we want to show is that, in fact, this thing has rho less than or equal to two, which will give us a contradiction. Um, so how is that going to work? Well, really what we're doing is we're using, we're using this observation a couple times. But essentially what you're doing is think of applying it, um, think of applying it to S here and you're splitting S into S minus Z and S intersect Z. And then you've got S minus Z here and R here. And so uh, basically the idea is you start with rho in G prime of S and you're going to throw out the intersection with Z. So you're gonna subtract off rho of uh, G prime S intersect Z. And then you're going to put back in, in place of that, you're going to put back in R here. Now that looks like, it sort of looks like it's almost too nice to be true. It sort of seems really easy. So the thing that you have to pay attention to is what's going on with the edges. So what's going on with these edges here? Right, what's going on with edges like this? Um, and the key is that uh, every edge, uh, every edge that you counted, so these, these edges are subtracting things off and you're counting them here in row of G prime S, right? Um, and then when you throw away S minus Z, now maybe you're not inducing that edge anymore. And so it feels like your, your row function should go up because you are subtracting off three for that edge, but the edge isn't there anymore. But the key is that every one of these edges is an image of some edge over here, okay? So every edge that was going from the world into Z here, is the image of some edge that was going from the world into R here, okay? Now, you may actually have more than one edge on the left here that gets mapped to a single edge on the right. 
but every edge on the right has at least one pre-image edge on the left. So what that means is that the part that you're subtracting off here <clears throat> um, in rho g of s minus z union r, this part is at least as big as the part you're subtracting off here for these edges. Um, and so that's where you get an inequality. It might actually be a strict inequality. We don't know. Um, if you had sort of, <clears throat> if you had two edges that were going, that sort of got mapped, these two edges get mapped to the same single edge here, then the inequality would be strict. We don't know if that happens or not. But the key is that we get this inequality. Uh, and then now we just have to see what these different values are. So this is at most two uh, because of right here. Uh, this value that you're subtracting off uh, is at least five. So why is it at least five? Um, well, that just comes from looking at K3. So, uh, so Z just induces this triangle. And basically every non-empty subset of the triangle has potential at least five. So we said for K1, it's five, for K2, it's uh, seven, and for K3, it's six. Um, and if you were to just sort of have two vertices without the edge between them, it would be even bigger, it would be 10. So the minimum of all those subgraphs has uh, row five. And then this last part, uh, row GR, well, that's because we said that R was a counterexample, right? So you're assuming that this was false and R was a counterexample. And so it's a counterexample to what? To having row at least six. So it must be at most five. Um, and so when you run the algebra, that's two, but that's a contradiction because you found some subset of these vertices, S minus Z union R, that has potential at most two, that has row at most two, which contradicts your hypothesis. Okay. So that is the gap lemma. Um, and it, you know, if you're interested, um, ask Bernard and he'll, he'll point you to somewhere where this is written down and you can sort of stare at it. But um, it's, a, it's a really cool argument. Um, and I, I can brag about it because it's not my argument. Um, this is from Kostochka and Nancy's paper. Uh, okay, uh, let's see. So we get a contradiction. Okay, so that's proving the gap lemma. Um, any questions on this um, before we move on to something a little bit different? Okay. All right, so, oops, I should clear that. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna tell you about what we actually proved. Uh, so we, we uh, were proving something about uh, near bipartite graphs. So a graph G is near bipartite if you can split the vert vertex set into two parts I and F, where I is an independent set and F as a forest. Um, so the thing to think about is that this lives somewhere between being two colorable and three colorable. So if you have something that's two colorable, you can just take one color class as I and the other color class as F. That'll be fine. If you have something that is um, near bipartite, so you have, uh, you have one that's an independent set and the other that's a forest, well, that, that's certainly three colorable because the forest is two colorable. Um, but both of these uh, containments are, are, are strict. So we'll see some examples in just a minute. Um, let me just show you. So here's an example of an IF partition. So this is the prism over K3. Um, and I on, on my slides today are the circled vertices and F is everything else. So this is a valid IF partition for this graph. Um, here's another one. Um, so we have a rule in, uh, in the seminar that I used to run for years that if you're giving a talk on graph theory, you have to have the Peterson graph somewhere in the talk. Uh, so this is our place. Um, and uh, here again, the circled vertices are an independent set and then the remaining vertices induce a forest. So this is a valid IF partition. Uh, and then, so, uh, Bernard said that he told you a little bit about critical graphs for coloring. So this is a, a very similar thing. An NB critical, NB is short for near bipartite. 
An NB critical graph is one that is not near bipartite, so it doesn't have this partition. But if you delete any edge, then it becomes near bipartite. Okay. Uh, so here are some examples of near bipartite critical graphs, NB critical graphs. So sort of the easiest one to look at is K4. Uh, so K4, the chromatic number is four, so it's certainly not near bipartite because that's a proper uh, that's a proper subset of three colorable. Uh, but K4 is edge transitive, so there's only one edge you can consider deleting, and let's say it's this one. Um, if you were to delete this edge, then you could make this vertex be I and this vertex be I, and the two vertices at the bottom be F. Okay, so that shows that it is it doesn't have a near bipartite. Uh, it is not near bipartite. It doesn't have one of these these IF partitions. But if you delete any edge, then it has one. Um, another example is is the five wheel. Um, so here there's sort of two equivalences of edges. So there's the spoke. So if you delete a spoke, then you put each of its ends in I and you put the other four vertices around the outside as F. Um, if you delete some edge around the, the uh, perimeter, um, then you put each of, uh, then you put the middle vertex in I and you put everything else into F, okay? So if you delete an edge, it has one. And just like K4, this graph is four chromatic. And so it certainly doesn't have a, uh, an IF partition itself. And you can sort of do the same thing for each of these other graphs. There's uh, more equivalences of equivalence classes of edges. So it starts to get a little more tedious to walk through all the, the cases. But um, yeah, these are uh, most of these graphs actually are in fact four chromatic. So this one is not. This one is uh, K222. So it's the complete tripartite graph. Um, but uh, these other ones are actually four chromatic. So they, they don't ha even have a three color. So those are just some examples. So what did we prove? Um, so we're going to prove a statement that's sort of analogous to what Kostochka and Yancey proved for three coloring. So you define. Uh, this row function, which is a little bit different than the row function before, now the ratio is three over two. So now what this is doing is it's sort of measuring how far you are away from having average degree three. Okay, uh, and then you define the potential function is just just analogous to what we saw before. Um, and what we said is if G is a multigraph with uh, with potential at least negative one, and G has no K4 or Moser spindle, then G is near bipartite. And this is sharp infinitely often. So a couple things, um, K4 and Moser spindle. So let's go back. So this is K4, you know, this is the Moser spindle. Um, so this is a graph that is uh, four chromatic, so it can't possibly be near bipartite. And any graph that contains this as a subgraph can't be near bipartite because it would have to, um, you'd have to come up with a near bipartite uh, or an IF partition for this thing, which is a problem because it's four chromatic. Um, so if you sort of rule out these two things as subgraphs, then uh, you're going to get that the graph is near bipartite when this potential hypothesis is true. And what is this saying? Again, basically what this is saying is uh, that you're allowed to essentially have average degree about three. You're allowed to have average degrees slightly more than three. Uh, but this is sharp infinitely often. So here is our, uh, our class of uh, graphs that show this is sharp. So in order to show that this is sharp, I want to show you a couple things. First of all, I want to show you that these graphs um, are NB critical. And I also want to show you that, uh, that these graphs have uh, potential equal to negative two. So negative two is just sort of just slightly worse than negative one, right? Um, what does it mean intuitively to have potential negative two? Uh, it means that uh, you're sort of close to being three regular, except you're allowed to have one more edge than if you were three regular. 
Okay, so if you look at this graph, this graph, everybody's degree three, except you have two vertices of degree four. Here's one and here's one. So uh, as a result, this graph is going to have potential negative two, right? Because if you had three regular, it would be potential zero. But then when you add in two vertices of degree four, that's the same as sort of adding one more edge past being three regular. Um, and you add that extra edge and it drops the it drops the row value by two. And so it drops from zero down to negative two. Okay. Um, so let's let's see why this graph uh, doesn't have uh, an IF partition. So the thing to think about with these multi edges is that uh, in any IF partition of uh, with a multi edge, the two endpoints have to get opposite colors. So one has to be I and the other has to be F. They certainly can't be both I because it wouldn't be an independent set, but they also can't both be F. Because if they were both F, then you get a two cycle in your supposed forest. Okay, so, so that's not allowed. So what that means is suppose that this thing had an IF partition, then one of these guys at the left end is I and the other one is F, but that means that this guy has to be F, right? Because one of its neighbors is I. So he's F, so he's I, so he's F, so he's I, so he's F, so he's I, and then you get down to the end and now you're in trouble because you've got this guy I and these other two guys would both have to be F, but then you get a two cycle in your forest, okay? So that shows that this graph doesn't have an IF partition and showing that it's actually critical uh, is a little bit of a nuisance, but it's just sort of tedious, but it's relatively straightforward. Basically, you just think about like, what kind of edge could you drop? Um, and essentially you could drop an edge on one of the edge gadgets, or you could drop one of these single edges, or you could drop one in a parallel edge. And you kind of work through the different cases and you construct an IF uh, partition in, in each of those cases. Um, so a good thing to think about is you can make this arbitrarily long. And each time that you make it, you sort of add another one of these chunks in in the middle, you add two more vertices and you add three more edges which means that this row function doesn't change because you added three edges and you added two vertices. So the net that you added is zero. Now, this result for, uh, for multigraphs is not super interesting because um, if your graph was too degenerate, um, then it would be really easy. You can just three color it um, by um, sort of by induction. Um, and you can essentially adapt that proof and, and get a nearby, uh, an IF partition. So being uh, too degenerate would be, uh, would follow from having potential uh, greater than or equal to one. So you haven't really gained a whole lot over what you would get from degeneracy. So this is sort of not as exciting of a result. But if we restrict to simple graphs, so we rule out these parallel edges, then you can prove something stronger. So now the thing to look at is this ratio eight fifths. So eight fifths, well, when you're talking about what's the average degree, it's actually two times eight over five. So it's 16 over five, which is 3.2. So now you sort of, um, now you, you sort of, uh, by restricting to simple graphs, you are allowed to, uh, are able to accommodate a denser family of graphs, right? So to put this in context, uh, the kostochka yancey result was uh, that you can three color the graph when uh, essentially when the average degree is not more than 10 thirds, right? Um, so this is, so 10 thirds is 3.3 repeating. So here it's 3.2. And so that kind of makes sense because uh, being near bipartite is sort of a stronger requirement than being three colorable. So you've got this eight fifths. Oh, so I defined it. So here's the, here's the theorem. It says, if you're a simple graph with potential at least negative four, um, and then now we have this sort of annoying little thing and no subgraph in some finite family H, uh, which I'll say a little bit more about, um, then G is near bipartite. And this is sharp infinitely often. So um, 
let's see what to say. So let me first off, let me show you the um, the sharpness family. Um, so what you want is you want graphs with uh, potential equal to negative five uh, that don't have one of these uh, IF partitions, right? And here they are. So this was the these these were the graphs for uh, for multi for multi graphs, and now for simple graphs we do this. Um, and the thing to think about is we came up with some sort of gadget that we put in everywhere you had parallel edges, right? Um, and you can work through what it is, but the important thing about this gadget is that it, it needs to give us the same functionality that we were getting from the parallel edges. And what we were getting from the parallel edges is that the endpoints of parallel edges have to get different colors. They can't both be colored I and they can't both be colored F. And so it's the same thing here you can sort of work through, obviously these guys can't both be colored I because they're adjacent. Um, but you can also look and see if you color both of these guys F, then you can only make most one of these guys I, and then you end up getting a cycle uh, up through that's colored F, or maybe if you color this one I, then these three all get colored F, and that doesn't work. So if you have an IF partition of this graph, then each place where you have one of these gadgets, one of the endpoints is I and the other is F. And now, if you believe that this gadget gives you the same functionality, then you get right away that these graphs uh, don't have an IF partition. And it's the exact same proof as before. You sort of start at the end, one of these is I and one is F, and you work all the way down to the other end, and then you run into trouble because this one is I and these guys can't both be F. So, uh, let's talk about the potential of these things. So the, the key to, to notice is that every time that you add another chunk in the middle, you add five vertices and you add eight edges. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So there's eight edges. Uh, and now why is the potential of this thing actually equal to negative five? Well, you can think of, okay, so think of this little gadget here, including this pendant edge. Okay, that's five vertices and eight edges. So if you think about that for a second, you can think of it kind of like this. Here's your gadget, and then let's say his pendant edge is here, and then this guy, his pendant edge is here, this guy, his pendant edge is here, this one, his pendant edge is here, this one, his pendant edge is here, so it all, you can partition the, the edge set up into copies of this gadget, except for one edge. So it's just like you would have, it's just like what we had before. You would have potential zero if every time you added uh, five vertices, you added eight edges, but there's one extra edge beyond that. And that one extra edge drives this row function down to negative five. It was at zero, but it drives down to negative five. And so that's where this result is sharp. Um, if you're at negative four or above, then you're okay. Once you go down to negative five, you get this infinite class of uh, counterexamples. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about, um, so the short answer for how did we, um, how did we prove our results is, it's kind of like the proof of the kostochka yancey result. Um, they, so the result that I showed you, um, their proof of Gritsch's theorem, uh, the proof is about four pages. Um, the proof of this result uh, is about 40 pages. Um, so there's some complications that come in. Um, and one of the complications is that the colors I and F are different, right? So um, when you think about proving the gap lemma, so, um, when you think about proving the gap lemma, when we proved it for them, we said, okay, you pre-color this thing, and then you contract it down to the triangle. And then if you got a coloring of this smaller graph, well, you can just sort of permute the colors on the triangle so they match what you were assuming, and then you can lift it back to a coloring of the original thing. Uh, but the problem is now, the colors I and F are really fundamentally different. And so, 
we can't just do this and then say, oh, well, I didn't like the coloring for the smaller part, so we'll just permute the colors. Um, and so the way that we get around that, um, oops, the way that we get around that is we actually have to prove a more general statement that allows for pre-coloring some vertices. And so pre-coloring means that um, you're going to specify this vertex has to be colored I and this vertex has to be colored F. Uh, so, so the pre-coloring is, it, there's, there's work there. Um, that is not the biggest obstacle. Um, a really big obstacle, unfortunately, um, is this family fancy H. Um, these are these uh, subgraphs that are forbidden. Um, so I sort of swept that under the rug a little bit. Uh, it's not like there's just one or two or three graphs in, uh, that are forbidden. The, this, this class, fancy H, it's got hundreds of graphs in it. Um, so we didn't actually like enumerate them all. What we proved is that there's, uh, we sort of gave some way of constructing them and we made some argument that they don't have more than 21 vertices. So there's some finite set of them because there's a finite set of graphs that have at most 21 vertices, but uh, unfortunately there's a lot of them. So uh, you have to do a lot of work when you, uh, when you use your gap lemma to add in an edge, say, or somehow modify the graph and take advantage of that gap lemma. Um, now you have to do a lot of work to make sure that you didn't create any subgraph H in fancy H. Because if you did, then you can't invoke the induction hypothesis. So what that means is you have to sort of say, um, you have to really understand which graphs are in fancy H. And then you say, oh, so those guys, the forbidden graphs, they look like this. And the thing that we're building over here, it looks like this and they're different, right? Somehow I'm proving that I didn't create anything bad. Um, and, and that's a lot of work. Um, that's probably at least 10, maybe 15 pages worth of work. Um, another problem uh, is that if you notice, um, in their result, they were saying the potential is at least, uh, and there was, if the potential is at least three in the kostochki yancey result, um, and potential at least three ends up meaning that the max average degree is strictly less than 10 thirds. In our result, we said the, the potential is at least negative four. And so that's a little bit of a problem because um, what we want to say, because what it does is it says that the, the max average degree is not much more than 16 fifths, right? It's sort of because it's, it's negative rather than positive, um, if you sort of discharge and get everyone to 16 fifths, you're not quite at a contradiction. You've got to do a little bit more work, find a little bit more charge. Um, and uh, if you can't find the charge, then you have to actually construct a coloring of the graph. Uh, and that also is probably, I don't know, at least 10 pages of work. Um, so what we do there, uh, we, we end up showing that G almost consists of an independent uh, set of four vertices and three vertices inducing a forest. So it's like this. Um, and the idea is sort of you, you do your discharging and you say, um, what, um, what would be the case where everybody ends up with exactly as much charge as is promised, right? And if everybody ends up with uh, as much charge as promised, then they all have to be either de uh, degree four vertices or degree three vertices. Uh, sort of higher degree vertices are gonna get you extra charge and they'll, they'll allow you to get this contradiction. Um, so it's almost just uh, a set of four vertices and three vertices inducing a forest. If it was that, then that would be great. You would just call all your four vertices I and you would call everything else F. But the problem is that it's almost a forest, but it might actually be a cycle, for example. There might be like a few extra edges or something. Um, and so then you have to come up with some sort of other way to do the coloring. So you can sort of break open the cycle, like something like this. Um, so you've got a lot of flexibility, but it ends up being a bit of a tedious case analysis. So these are sort of the big three 
Um, I would say the one that costs us the most is probably the second one, but the, the third one still costs us more than 10 pages. Uh, all right, so um, I won't talk too much about algorithms. Um, maybe one comment about in typical uh, reducibility and discharging proofs, um, it's easy to translate it into an algorithm. Basically what your algorithm is, is find a reducible configuration, rip it out. Um, color the rest of the graph by minimality and then put it back in. And so if you were to really make this an algorithm, it would be rip out a, a reducible configuration, rip out another one, rip out another one until you bottom out and you have a very small graph and then you color it and then you start building it back up. Um, a similar thing works here, but it's a little bit more complicated. And the reason is because of this, it's a combination of this gap lemma and also the fact that we have to uh, make sure that we are not uh, we're not having any of these reducible uh, any of these forbidden subgraphs, and so uh, checking that you don't have any of these uh, bad subgraphs. Uh, the way that we came up with to do it runs an end of the twenty one time, and that's tied to the fact that I said uh, the number of vertices is bounded. It's something like twenty one or twenty two. And so this, we didn't work real hard to try and make this efficient, but it's it's polynomial time. Um, all right, so one more thing to mention briefly, um, there's a cool uh, general thing about um, any time that you have some sort of weight function where the vertices have some weights and the, uh, the edges uh, have some weights and you're trying to find the set with minimum uh, row, um, you can do that with a reduction to max flow min cut. Um, and this is not our result. This is a result of Goldberg from almost 40 years ago. Um, but uh, max flow min cut, if you're not familiar with it, is really powerful and can do a lot of things. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to go into the details here, but this is sort of an example that we have in the paper. Um, if you're interested, uh, I will say about our paper, um, don't read it because it's too long and it's, it's, it's a pain, but you might wanna read the first like five or eight pages or something because in that part and the introduction, I really tried to like go into detail about why stuff works the way it does and where different parts of the argument come from. Um, so uh, if you're curious about this, that's what I would say, go and read sort of the introduction and then stop before it gets horrible. Um, but okay, um, so let's sum up. Um, what did we do today? So we started out um, and we wanted to prove Gritsch's theorem that if you're planar with no three cycle, we wanted to prove that just using edge density. Um, so we said, okay, well, if you can fold away these four faces, then edge density, then you have a planar graph with girth at least five. And so that's, uh, that's nicer. Um, and we wanted to, uh, we say, maybe we don't need the planarity, maybe just this uh, bound of 10 thirds on MAD would be enough. Um, but the necklaces are the counterexamples, right? And so to get away from the necklaces and to sort of cut those out of satisfying the, uh, the hypothesis, we introduced this notion of, uh, of rho. And this is sort of a better way to measure sort of additively uh, exactly how close you are to having average degree 10 thirds. Um, and the key was that necklaces have uh, potential equal to two. And so as soon as your potential goes to at least three, and so this is sort of saying you're slightly more sparse, you have just a little bit less edge than you had here, then you're gonna be okay. And remember potential is defined as the min uh, over all subgraphs. So um, so that's going to allow us to go by this uh, inductive argument. And uh, the way that they proved this was it's a reducibility and discharging argument. Um, and a big part of what makes their reducibility work is this gap lemma that we, we talked about. Um, what we did, what I did with uh, Matt Yancey, was we looked at near bipartite uh, graphs, which is somewhere in between being two colorable and three colorable. And here, uh, sort of the interesting case was for simple graphs. 
uh, and we define the potential, uh, the row function this way and the potential that way. And essentially what this is saying is, um, if you have uh, average degree or max average degree is at most uh, 16 over five, then you will have one of these partitions. Uh, well, that's not quite true. There's, there's this family fancy H of subgraphs that you have to avoid. But if you, uh, if you avoid those, then you're gonna be okay. Um, and the proof was sort of like the kostochka yancey thing, but with various complications that added significant length to the proof. Um, and then we showed the sharpness examples. Um, and the sharpness examples for the simple graphs were kind of based on the ones for the multi-graphs, but with this edge gadget in place of the parallel edges. Uh, if you're interested, here is the, uh, the URL. Um, go and don't read this paper, but read the introduction to the paper because that will be more accessible. So let me stop there. Thanks. Let's thank the speaker. <laughs> thank you, Dan. That was really nice. And uh, your 50 minute filled the entire class. Yeah, yeah. I kind of sort of, sort of slowed down more than I. No, no, no. I think it was great. I, I, I like. Okay. Cool. Any more um, questions, anyone? So, so one of the things that I I sometimes do when I speak. Um, at a small-ish seminar and there are grad students, is I go around and I pick on the grad students and say, you have to ask a question. Um, so I'm like, I'm not in the same room as you, so I can't sort of physically bar you from leaving the room before, uh, before you ask a question. But um, one thing that's a really useful skill is learning how to ask questions even when you didn't understand everything that was said. Sort of trying to think about okay, how much did I understand and where can I sort of push just a little bit past whatever I understood? Um, this is actually also a really useful skill when you're doing research, right? When you're trying to figure out some big dark forest and you don't understand it um, and you're kind of like, okay, here's the edge of my light cone. How can I just like nudge my light cone a little bit further out, right? Um, so um, I would definitely encourage you guys, I'll, I'll hang out for, you know, however long you want, but um, just try to think about, was there something that you kind of understood but didn't totally understand? I'm happy to answer, answer any questions. I was, I was gonna ask a question. So I liked your comment on uh, use it until the magic becomes method or something along those lines. Uh, right, right, I'm, right. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm curious about uh, how you knew discharging or this potential method was, was gonna work with this problem. What sorts of problems or? Are those techniques? Um, so for this particular technique, um, it, it tends to work on um, things that are sort of some variation of, of graph coloring, and it tends to work well on sparse graphs. Um, one other thing that I should say is um, you only see the successes right? You don't see all the failures. So uh, I was working on, I've tried this technique on a variety of other problems and don't have nearly as many papers to show for it as problems that I've tried it on. Um, there was a problem that I was working on for a couple months that I really thought I had. And at the end, it just slipped away and, um, and it all fell down. So um, one thing about when you use uh, when you use induction in general, um, is if there's some case that's like not quite right, then it can blow up into an infinite family of counterexamples, right? Um, so uh, you have to be you have to be careful. Um, well, I guess what I would say is you try and you um, you look at what other people have done. Basically what people have done with this is it's some version of coloring for sparse graphs. Uh, so I'm gonna talk again on Thursday um, and show you something else that uh, Yancey and I did. Um, 
where it's it's the same sort of thing as this um, near bipartite, except now you want to put a bound on the order of the trees in your components of the forest. Um, so basically, uh, so you're going to partition into an independent set and a forest where each tree has at most three vertices or at most four vertices or something like that. Um, so that is a problem that people have been interested in. Um, and when I heard about that problem, I thought, ah, I know a, a method that should work well for this, right? So it's, it's kind of, um, so Feynman tells people how to, how to make people think you're a genius, right? And he says, what you do is you keep, um, you keep sort of 10 problems in the back of your head that are these big problems that you want to work on. And every time you learn a new technique, you test it against each of the 10 problems on the list. And most of the time, nothing works. But occasionally, you get a hit. And then people say, he must be a genius. Um, so it's kind of this idea of keeping your tools in mind. And every time you see a problem thinking, could this tool work? Or keeping your problems in mind. And every time you see a tool thinking, could this work? And there's a lot of attempts that don't end up panning out. Um, but very intuitively, uh, this is good for things that are some version of, of vertex coloring uh, for sparse graphs. So another place where this has worked, um, there's a nice result is something called star coloring. Um, and that is um, where it's a proper vertex coloring. And if you take the, um, the union of any two color classes, it should be a star forest. So basically another way to say it is um, there's no two colored uh, path on four vertices or cycle on four vertices. Um, but it's sort of, it's a lot like vertex coloring, but a little bit different. And so it still sort of works there. And it turns out that the extremal graphs are, are fairly sparse. If you look at say four star colorable, um, and so that's kind of, uh, I mean, a big part of uh, making this thing work is getting the right sharpness examples, right? If you, because, so I didn't talk so much about how it all works, but you first find your sharpness examples and you use the sharpness examples to set, to know what your potential function should be. Um, so it was after we, let's see. It was after we found this class of graphs that we settled on this eight fifths in the in the row, um, and so that's sort of another thing is, in order to make this work, typically you want to find sharpness examples, um, and then that inspires this here. Anyway, long long answer to your question. Who else? What do you got, Kate? Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I was kind of thinking about the, the near bipartite and, and that would though, would that, I guess it's just, yeah, you're trying to find if your graph is tripartite, uh, but I think it's a little bit different. Um, yeah, now so I'm like me... thinking more about examples. Um, so, so this is maybe a helpful family. Um, yeah. so these are all NB critical graphs. So like I said, most of these graphs um, are actually four chromatic. So all of these graphs require four colors except for this one. Mm -hmm. This is K222, which is three colorable, but the, up to isomorphism, there's only one coloring, right? You use color one here, color two here, color three here. Um, and now, even if you were to delete an edge, again, there's up to isomorphism, there's only one edge you can delete and say it's this one. All the edges, uh, it's an edge transitive graph. So if you delete this edge, you'll still get the four cycle that goes between color classes two and three, right? right. Um, so this is a graph that's three colorable, but it's not near bipartite. Um, it's, uh, right, uh, it's three colorable and it's, um, Oh, sorry. It is. It's near. Uh, it's near bipartite critical, but it's. Uh, but it's three colorable. I guess is the way I want to say it. Yeah. 
Uh, so most of, yeah. Um, so asymptotically, there's a big difference because asymptotically, the three critical graphs uh, all need at least um, sort of average degree 10 thirds. Whereas asymptotically, you know, we, we came up with these examples um, of these graphs that are nearby partite critical and they only need average degree 16 fifths. So asymptotically, there's a big difference, but when you're looking at small numbers of vertices, it's sort of hard to see, see that and make that distinction. Do you have anything, Kyle? Not at the moment, no. All right. So Daniel didn't turn on his camera, but you could still ask questions. Hello. Hi. Uh, so, um, so why did a uh, what was the reason for try uh, for trying to find near bipartite like colorings? Like, what was the motivation for that definition? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, there's a distinction between the motivation and my motivation. So, my motivation was to find a cool coloring problem that I could work on. Um, the motivation. Um, there are some connections to other things um, that I'm not super familiar with, but my co-author dropped them into the introduction in our paper. So these have been studied before. Um, I think sort of in some sense, one, one thing that mathematicians tend to do is they tend to start with a problem that they really like um, and sort of solve it thoroughly or as well as they can. And then they don't want to, they don't want to leave the problem alone so they like change things a little bit. So it's a new problem, right? Um, and so, uh, so because three coloring is so well studied and so interesting to a lot of people, uh, near bipartite is sort of a natural way to uh, strengthen your requirements on the coloring. Um, there have been some applications to other areas which I don't know off the top of my head, but I would say, um, Everything that I know and more about applications uh, is going to be in the introduction to this paper. Um, so uh, if you're curious, uh, take a screenshot or I will send the slides to Bernard and you can put them somewhere that you can get access to them. Um, but again, um, it's, a, it's an intimidating paper because it's 40 pages or something, but um, if you're curious about applications, go and just read, I think it's in the first four pages or something like that. It mentions a few places that you might look. So for you, it was kind of like just testing the methods on something harder. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think there's, there's sort of a combination of uh, it's cool and I'm trying to learn this method better. And mm -hmm. uh, part of my job as a math professor is to make papers. Um, uh, and I mean, I think, yeah, it's, this was actually um, the first paper where, uh, where I, uh, I succeeded in using the potential method. And it was something that I'd heard about and sort of seemed like initially when I first saw even the thing that I presented, the kostochka yancey result, it was very magic to me and I didn't understand it. And so by, by doing some projects on it that use it, um, you sort of learn it much better. Um, and so it was just an opportunity to, uh, to learn the method better. And there is also Nate, but Nate may be in his office where he doesn't have uh, anything but the uh, screen. And do you have a do you have a question, Nate? You can type it in the chat box.
Oh, something. <laughs> Not currently. Maybe. All right. Is the, you say the sparsity thing. So it works kind of if you have some kind of maximum average degree condition. Right? Yeah. So, so it's in a sense, it's you'd like to be able to use it everywhere that you can use uh, max average degree. Mm -hmm. um, in a sense, what the potential, uh, the row function is doing, it's measuring, somehow it's measuring max average degree, but it's like, um, so max average degree, you can think of, it measures a whole range of spectrum of, uh, of possible max average degree and, and row just zeroes in right on one value of max average degree and says how far are you additively off from this max average degree? So in the Kostochka Yancey, it was 10 thirds. And in ours, it was, uh, it was 16 fifths, right? And just saying sort of, um, how far are you away from that? And the point is that um, when you take a proper subgraph, if you have some graph where you satisfy it, when you take a proper subgraph, you sort of, you have a little bit of slack you satisfy it with a little bit more room than you needed by hypothesis. And so that extra, extra little bit of slack allows you to modify the graph in some way before you color it by minimality. And that modification is gonna give you more power for your reducibility. So uh, the hard part that I've found in proving the gap lemma is, um, is finding the right thing to put in so if we go all the way back to, uh, yeah, is putting the right thing to put in here for Z. So you need to find sort of the right little subgraph to put in here so that when you contract this, you color this and you contract it down, um, then you have some sort of small graph that ideally you want all of the subgraphs of this thing to have rho be high. Um, but you also need that then if you can color this whole thing, then you can lift it back. So you need to pick sort of the type of coloring. So there's some types of coloring where um, it's not obvious that when you contract it down and color the smaller graph, then you can lift it back and it will, if you could color G prime, then it would give you a coloring of G, right? Um, but you also need, uh, you could sort of do something where you put in lots of edges in Z but then if you have lots of edges here, then the row value on Z is going to be low. And if the row value on Z is low, um, then, uh, well, then here, this number is not going to be very much. Um, and so then this argument will break down. Um, so there's sort of a, a variety of different things that you have to balance. Okay. I was just wondering if so, and can you do this potential method, you say potential and planar, then maybe what's the problem is that getting the Z such that- Yeah, so so the, the uh, if, you, if you require planar, um, the issue would be sort of the following. Um, say that I had, say that I had uh, some graph here that has on the boundary of the graph, it has vertices that go like one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, around the outside. Now, when you contract that down and you identify all the things colored one, all the things colored two, all the color things colored three, the graph is not gonna be planar anymore if you contract it down to this triangle, right? Um, and in general, if you have a big R and there's lots of different uh, instances of a color on the boundary, it's going to be very far from planar when you contract it down here. So and I think that that would be interesting to do, but we need some, uh, we need some other uh, added idea about how to preserve that planarity. I see. And you don't have any bounds on the R, so it can be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. R, you want R to be, um, so here we allow R to go up all the way to uh, just to be size number of vertices minus one. Yeah, yeah. And typically it's gonna be something like that. And so um, so you could get sort of arbitrarily bad towards being planar um, when you contract it down to some constant size bit. 
See, so you can use planar graphs to give you a guess what should be the maximum average degree and then maybe yeah okay. yeah i mean so it's 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 very nice that it turned out that this the necklaces are show this thing is just sharp right mm -hmm. um right any All more right. questions Right, let's let's thank them again, and we'll see you again on Thursday. All right, I'll see you on Thursday, Bernard. <laughs>